Welcome everybody uh, who is here for the Lambtown Festival Virtual Sheep to Shawl Judging uh, for 2020. Uh, this was the first time that we ever attempted something like this or ever had to. So uh, we kind of adjusted on the fly and uh, I think we did a pretty okay job. Uh, you guys can let us know about that. Um, but just a couple things that I wanna mention before we get started. Um, Today is the final day of Lambtown Festival, but the app does not go away. So tomorrow, pull up your phone, pull up your web browser, Lambtown Festival app is still gonna be there. Uh, all the good vendors and all the, the beautiful photos and PDFs and things that they've put in there, they'll still be there. And over the next couple of weeks, uh, the vendor interviews, the meet the vendor interviews that we've been conducting over the past few days and then as, as well as this afternoon, we're gonna get those uh, uploaded to YouTube and those will be available directly through the app as well. And then same thing, the uh, judgings, like what we're going to watch today, and then the panel discussions that we had yesterday will also be available through the app and through the web version of the app. So uh, if you, you know, hear something today and you're like, wait, what did they say? Or, or if you want to go back and watch, you know, if you're one of the teams and you, you say, oh, I, I want to know what their critique is, you know, don't, don't worry about, you know, furiously writing down while they're talking. Uh, this will be available in video form so you can pick it up later. Um, yeah, that's it. And, and they, in case I didn't mention it, they'll be available on our uh, YouTube channel as well. So you can also head to uh, YouTube, type in Lambtown Festival, subscribe. That way, uh, when all those vendor videos and all the panels and stuff get uploaded, you'll, you'll get notified. Okay, so I'm going to talk for just a second about how this judging is going to go. So our, our two judges here, and I'll introduce them in, in just a second, uh, they have already done all the judging. So that part is completed. They, they spent the the part of a, a few days this week, uh, pouring over them and looking at them, uh, magnifying glasses and fine tooth combs and all that. Um, so that part is over. What we're gonna do today is um, we're gonna play a slideshow of each of the shawls. We've taken a, a half a dozen photos from different angles and we're gonna play a, a slideshow one at a time. And uh, our judges are going to talk about the shawls while that's playing. And then once the uh, slideshow is over, they're going to have the shawl in hand and uh, say any additional comments they want to talk about. And the, the order that we're going to go in is the order that our registrations were received. So it's one through 10, whoever signed up first, all the way through the last team. So these placements, you know, these are not placements. You're going to see them just go in a really random order. Uh, there's nothing particular about this order other than that's the day that that team happened to sign up. And since the teams don't know when the other team signed up, you know, it really doesn't have any difference. So uh, we're going to go in that order. Um, then we're going to uh, show the top five that our judges have chosen for us. Then we'll put out that little poll and then uh, we'll see the results. And then uh, our judges will talk about the top five in order. We'll count them down and end up with the championship. And here's the fun thing about this. And, and I'm talk about this a little bit more when I talk about how the judging went or the uh, the whole virtual competition virtual aspect of the competition with this year is our judges are completely blind they have no idea who the teams are they received a box with 10 shawls and the only information on them was that little number that you see right there exactly there's a number there's an info sheet that was uh, typed up by us here at Lambtown Festival so we took all the information that was provided to us by the teams typed it up and gave that to them as well. So they can't even recognize someone's handwriting if they know them, right? So this is completely blind. So the information, the feedback that they're gonna give to our teams is completely blind. They don't know if they're talking to a professional weaver or spinner or somebody who, you know, happened to, you know, this was their first time and they decided I wanna try spinning and do a sheepish shawl all at once. So uh, they have no idea who their feedback is going to. And I think that's, that's a really unique thing. It's something we've never been able to do before. Um, so yeah, it, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. The, the next two hours, I think are going to be really fun here. And, um, I think that's about it. So we will do, like I said, we'll do the, uh, we'll do the top five. We'll do a poll, of the top five, we'll count it down. Um, then we'll get our top three and our winners. And, uh, then it'll come back to me and I'll reveal who those team names were. So I don't even know yet the slideshow somewhere in here. Uh, I haven't looked at it yet. So there's only one person who actually knows who the winners are. That's our, that's our director of the festival. So um, can we
completely blind to me even. I just know the team names. All right, so what I'd like to do next is just talk briefly about a sheep to shell festival, uh, I'm sorry, a sheep to shell competition and what, what happens during one of these, uh, especially since we're gonna have maybe some new people who haven't uh, participated in one or, or seen one before who are watching this, especially since it's gonna be recorded later. So in a sheep to shell competition, you have uh, a team and if it's a live competition like we typically have at Lambtown Festival, uh, you have eight people, which includes seven workers and one educational liaison who is there to uh, inform the crowd about what's going on. And they get four and a half hours to start with uh, a loom that has already been warped. So all of the threads going lengthwise are already set up and ready to go. And they have a fleece that has been washed, but not prepared. And so once the gun goes off, they have four and a half hours to card and process and spin and ply and then weave that shawl and uh, then get it off the shawl, uh, tie up the, the final threads, uh, do the fringe, everything like that. So they have four and a half hours to do that. And that's how it typically goes in uh, an in-person sheep to shawl festival, uh, sheep to shawl competition like at Lambtown Festival. Now the last two years we had seven and then eight teams, which is the largest competitions in the country. And this year we said, well, we have a lot of good momentum going on. We don't want to lose this momentum while we're, uh, you know, just because of COVID, let's think outside the box. Let's, let's come up with something and, and make this happen virtually. And so what we did was we said, okay, well, let's nix the part of the team requirement as far as sizes. So we said, okay, you don't have to have, you know, a team of seven or eight people. You don't have to have that educational liaison because we really didn't want to have these large groups of people together. We wanted it to be as small as possible, as, as small as people were comfortable with. And so what we did was we said, okay, so if we take one person out of it, and if we take out the automatic 30 minutes that are set aside for lunch, that leaves you with 28 total working hours. If you assume there's seven people in four hours. So we said, you can have, you have to have at least two people and you, those two people can take the entire 28 hours. And we said you can compete over seven weeks. We began in late August. We went through September. And we said Saturday and Sunday between 10 and 5 on any of those weekends, you can compete. That's your, that's your time. And it was really a collaborative effort, a lot of coordination uh, where the team captains would say, okay, my team is going to compete from this time to this time on this day and this time to this time on this day. And then we had moderators go on Zoom and watch them. We had lots of people tuning in, uh, you know, 60, 70 people some days just on a Saturday afternoon to watch and hang out. So, uh, you know, we thought it was a really good turnout, especially compared to what we normally see in the stands on, on any given Lambtown Festival for the comp competition. Uh, so there was also a lot of tracking to be done because the teams had to track the times and make sure that they stayed within their 28 hours. Uh, so it was really fun to come up with this, this new style, this new set of rules. It was really fun to watch the teams compete uh, and adjust and adapt to this new style. Um, in a regular competition, there's a little bit of slippage where someone might be standing around at a particular point in time. Uh, you know, once, whether it's the weaver who has nothing to do once the fiber has been prepped and everybody's spinning and they're just kind of waiting to weave, they might just be standing around. So in some ways, I think this gave a little bit more time in certain ways to other teams, but then they also had to make up for the fact of this is so new, what are we doing? And we also had some new teams joining us. So that was a lot of fun to see as well. Uh, so that's kind of how Sheep to Shawl both uh, in a live and then in virtual would go. So just to give you guys some background. Okay. And let me introduce our judges. Give me one second here. Let me pull this up. Uh, so Kay and Sand, hello there, sitting there patiently. Uh, they are our judges for this year. And let me read their bio. So Sand and Kay are lucky enough to be both married and working together as studio artists. They have been working in the fiber arts for 20 plus years, weaving, spinning, processing fiber, dyeing, sewing, and stitching. Over the years, they have worked in various capacities within the fiber community, including owning and teaching in a retail shop, uh, doing design work, and now making all sorts of fabulous things in their studio. Uh, so for those of you who are local to us, 
uh, in Northern California in the Bay Area, especially if you're in the South Bay, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, Pearlescent's Yards, which they were part of the ownership group there for uh, a long time. So hello, Kay and Sand, welcome. And would you two like to talk uh, just a little bit about your judging process? Sure. So a little bit more about Shifty Shoal. Go for it. Uh, the current focus is totally on education and community. You know, historically, there was also the competing to show off your skill set. You know, how good are these people? The, the product that comes out, comes out showing marketability for a team. That's a local community that's producing. So there's some of that. We still take pride in how good can we do it? But it's mainly an educational event now, as you mentioned, so that people can educate the community, the group can become more educated. Hopefully the teams will take the feedback and break it down and do some debriefing afterward and maybe some more test runs. We are huge fans of go to the loom, play, test, learn how this works. And that is really the focus of the sheep to shawl these days. So our judging criteria, um, a lot of competitions use some kind of point system. Um, Lambtown Festival has not ever done that. And so we continued with that tradition of not using a point system um, in part because it really works well for us. Um, so <clears throat> we went through the criteria, looked at each shawl, um, and we did also try to kind of limit the time that we spent with each shawl to more closely mirror what would happen in a live event. Um, because when you're doing it live, if you're judging live, you have probably 15 minutes or so to work through a shawl and make your comments and so on. So we did try to keep kind of with that theme. Um, and um, the other interesting thing about doing this digitally as opposed to in, in a live environment is that when the shawl comes off the loom and is finished, it needs to be, in this case for, for our competition, it needs to be 72 inches long. Um, a shawl relaxes a little bit over the first little bit of time, maybe a few days to a week. So since we didn't see these until at least a week after they had come off the loom, um, there was a differential often in the measured shawl length from when it first came off the shawl and the team recorded their length and when we actually measured it for judging purposes. So that's, a, that's kind of a little interesting thing that happens in this environment that would, would be different from what happens in a live event. Um, and by relaxing, relaxing in this case, we think of relaxing as stretching out, but actually when it comes to woven goods, relaxing actually means drawing in. So hence some of the shawls measured shorter for judging than they were according to their submitted length. Because of course you take the tension off when you remove it from the loom. Um, and our comments are focused on um, feeding back information that will help the participants of each team build their skills um, and you know, increase their competency. So that's really what, what our aim is here. Anything else? I have a couple of tools to discuss that we use for judging and then we can move right into stuff. Can, can you also describe the different areas in particular oh, that you're absolutely. looking at? Yeah. So there are four general categories that we looked at. We looked at spinning. We wanted to see how the, so we were looking for things like, how were the single spun? How did the plying occur? Um, it was the resulting yarn relatively even, um, was the yarn appropriate to the chosen, um, weaving draft. Then we looked at weaving technically. So how did the selvages look? How did the ends look? Um, is the beat even? Does the shawl stay the same width throughout? Are there errors? Um, are there errors? Treadling errors, pick errors, selvage errors, um, tension errors, all of those things are, are things we're looking for. Um, we're looking for um, 
how does the shawl hold together as a design? Do the colors work with the draft chosen? Um, is, are the warp and weft yarns appropriate to the set that was selected? Um, complexity of draft. Complexity of draft. Um, how, did, how did that play into the uh, colors that were chosen um, and you know the overall, how well um, the team chose um, their draft um, to and fiber combinations and, and their fiber combinations. And then um, there's kind of an overall quality. And in, in that category, I put most of my finishing comments. Um, how was it finished? Did that finish work? Did it work for the yarn selected? Did it, you know, did the, did the um, finisher actually have long enough fringe to do whatever they chose to do? Or, um, you know, what's the drape? And that has to do with how wearable is it? Um, is it kind of stiff? Does it like fold around the body? Um, how, um, super technical term here, how cushy is it? Um, uh, you know, does it have a good hand feel? Um, and did the choices that the team make maximize the characteristics of the fleece and the work that they chose? We tend to think in terms of terms like poor, fair, good, excellent, rather than a point system. Okay. Okay. And then um, a couple of tools. And then we have some tools that we use when we're looking at a shawl. So let me get to the right camera here. This is actually a, a grid that is sewists and quilters use. It's quite thick. So it's used often for a cutting edge, but it has lots of graduated increments and I will try to get in here. And what we were using it for, for this purpose is a uh, weaving angle. Cause a balanced weave should be at 45 degrees. And there's a line there that actually get, lets me lay it down. And that's 30. Is it? Yeah, the 45 is down here. Oh, this is the 45. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to move in a reverse <laughs> manner is sort of exciting. So we use that to judge, to help us look at how balanced a weave was. Because in the case of something like a shawl, for wearability purposes, we would really like the weave to be relatively balanced because you'll get your maximum drape that way. Other things we use that I use as regular tools all the time is a spinner. One of these is a wraps per inch tool. And one of these is a twist angle tool. And those allow you to measure the diameter of your singles and or plied yarn and the twist angle at which it is twisted. And these are tools that every spinner should have. And some of what you'll hear us talk about in the shawls is when those aspects of either twist angle of single or twist angle applying didn't quite work out or when it did work out really beautifully. And also this is kind of a multifunction tool because it also has a wraps per inch function. You'll see these little two inch um, kind of slot here. That's what you use to wrap your yarn around to see what your set should be. So that's, um, that's another thing you'll hear us talking about is whether the set actually um, worked. worked well for the draft, the yarn size and so on. All right, anything else? Um, no, I think that's it. Okay. Okay, all right. So let me go back to the gallery view there. And what I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm going to start screen sharing and everybody will get a a glimpse of all 10 of the shawls, just a little overview, a little morsel. And then I'm gonna swipe out of that and we'll start in with the slideshow uh, of the very first shawl and Kay and Sand are gonna start talking about then. And um, once that slideshow is done, then they'll have the shawl in hand to start talking about it a little bit more. And then we'll just progress through the shawls that way. So let me get this screen share up and running so that you guys can see it. go. There we go. Okay. So here is all 10 of the gorgeous shells. And this is the order uh, left to right, top to bottom. That's how we're going to look at them. That's the order the registrations came in one through 10. So I am going to swipe here. 
and we will start this very first slideshow. Okay, team number one. Team number one um, did not spin their warp. Um, and the only reason that that's important is that it you get a little bit extra credit if you spin your warp. Um, it is a naturally dyed wool. The weft was created from a Jacob wool fleece. They used a 10 wraps per inch and 10 to 12 picks per inch. Um, that wraps per inch would represent the set. The shawl length is 72 inches, which is exactly what it needed to be. The width is 22 inches, slightly wider than the required 19. As you can see from that lovely image, it's a mustard and cream with a little green pop around the edge. So you'll see that green pop a little bit more and a little bit later on here. There we go. There's the lovely cream, gray, a green and gold color combination. Sets it off very nicely. I thought this was an excellent choice. I think it highlights the weft nicely and the use of the cream at the edge means that your cream weft does not obscure, you don't get a barber pulling at the edge. So that's a very nice effect. The items considered in the spinning, we have yarn design twist in both the singles and the plied yarn. Looking at the wraps per inch and or diameter of the resulting yarn, evenness of the spinning, appropriateness of yarn to the design and set and the yarns produced. So in this shawl, the spinning shows quite even singles and a very balanced ply. So throughout the shawl, the weft is quite lovely in how it's in the shawl. It looks like the spinners were able to manage uh, spinning quite evenly for the singles. This is an issue sometimes with teams where different spinners don't produce the same diameter of single or the same twist angle. So this looks quite lovely. You can really see it in this picture right here as we, we zoom in and out that it, it looks like one person did the spinning and did so consistently. And that I, again, because in this case, it's completely blind, we have no idea how many team members were on this team. We do not know what they spun on, but it looked to me like the spinner had a pretty good control of the um, process, the spinners. And the plier did a good job. There is a nice picture. You can see even a little bit at the beginning of the zoom, in, zoom out, uh, the singles are plied to the point of having the singles fibers open all the way out, which is a, the definition of a balanced yarn. And as a result, it lays in this pattern really beautifully. It's, it's a nice presentation. It's well matched with the weft, or sorry, the warp. <clears throat> so the, um, they were able to actually produce a yarn that was comparable in size. <clears throat> there, are, um, very, there are no errors in this shawl, no tension errors, no pick errors, no treadling errors. Um, it's very even, so the shawl has, um, the selvages are very even, and it's also the same width all the way throughout the shawl, which is um, a really important thing. And it means that the beat has been even throughout the weaving process. Um, it's a, a nice design. It's complex enough to be a nice showcase, but not so complex that it would make the weaving too challenging to do in a competition setting. Well-chosen color palette between the commercial warp and the hand-spun weft really displays the pattern very well. And it's a good color combination for wearability. So a lot of people would be able to wear this. That's a, a real plus when you're looking at a shawl. Mm -hmm. And then on our finish. So this is really beautiful twisted fringe and you saw it in the last photograph. Um, <clears throat> the only thing that I might have changed on this is I might have used it up, I can't see it. a slightly smaller bundle because as you can kind of see here, the bundle size causes a slight pulling in the fell line, which is that the end of the shawl, um, but it has really nice drape 
It's very crushable, so it'd be a very cozy shawl to wear. It's a, yeah, it has a soft drape and good, good cush, so good twist angles chosen on the singles to create a fabric that's very wearable and lovely and will be very nice wrapped around. I, I would buy a shawl like this, mm -hmm. it's quite lovely. <laughs> So it does show that the um, team had a really good knowledge of the wools that they chose and how to maximize the wools into a very wearable shawl. And I will note, because this is a Jacob wool, they clearly chose good quality Jacob from the fleece. Jacob, as many of you know, has many different qualities to a single fleece. So this was chosen well, both to for color consistency and making sure that they chose the finer parts of the fleece. It's got a nice hand to it. So good job yep. on, on sorting that fleece, folks. Well done. Okay, let's move on to number two. number two. Okay, give me one second and let me get screen sharing back up. Yep. Okay, <clears throat> team number two did spin their warp. Um, it is a hand painted warp spun from Romney and the weft is a Romney as well. Uh, the wraps per inch or set is at 10. The picks per inch is at six. This is a 78 inch shawl and 20 inches wide. Um, the hand dyed warp is blue, purple, turquoise, and a little, and then the weft is a white Romney. So kudos for really maximizing this color combination. It has a beautiful watery look to it, um, partially because of the hand-dyed warp and partially because of the draft that was chosen. This undulating draft really gives that super watery kind of flavor to it. Um, it does give the shawl a little bit of texture as you'll see as the undulations versus the uh, intermediate pattern are cause a little bit of buckling. So you wanna be aware of that when you choose your draft that your combination of patterns could cause some buckling. Okay, under the, under the yarn, I did say that. Okay. So the spinning in this, uh, is is quite um it's a little uneven. the warp because we have a hand spun warp here we have to think in terms of evaluating the warp as well as the weft a hand spun warp does again give a little bump up to a, a team you can see that's a little uneven. and yeah even in the photo here you can see that the warp is a t the spinning's a little bit uneven in diameter in diameter and in twist and that was really visible the weft is where i could really see that the there's still some i found some spots where there's still some kemp which is a uh a, a fused type of fiber that the sheep can grow which is undesirable and those should have been picked out in the course of carding or in the spinning if they made it through the carding process so i would have liked to have seen those come out especially since romney's a little stiffer usually we don't make garments out of romney because it's a little, a little coarse it's often recommended for housewares rather than garments. The design and the set are well, pretty well suited to this yarn. There's some interesting uh, considerations when you use this kind of an undulating draft in terms of how the warp and weft interplay. And I think that part was actually reasonably good. But again, I would have liked to have seen the singles in the weft to be more even. You can see on this close up here how that there's a lot of variation within a small area in the weft from very large, puffy, open, underplied single, uh, lo lovely, puffy, puffy, open singles that were then underplied as well. So there, it, the yarn is not as organized appearing as I would have liked for it to be. And as a result, it obscures the undulation a little bit where it would have made that undulation a crisper pattern if it had not been quite so variable. And right there on the screen, you can actually see one of the pick errors. 
So again, that weighs into the judging for this. And there were a number of pick errors on this, this particular shawl. Um, the other interesting thing is that, <clears throat> as any weaver will tell you, burying ends is always a challenge. Um, and it is a really master level skill when you are able to bury your ends and have them pretty much disappear. Um, it's something that this team should work on a little bit because we found a few spots where the ends had popped out having been buried. And there were a couple spots where they'd woven it back in on a pick and it distorted the pattern in that area. Um, and the other thing, the, well, let's talk for a minute about the drawing yeah. on the pattern because yeah. the way this undulation works, there's a sort of basket weave section in between each undulation and those drew in and became tight. That is consistent with what I mentioned earlier about that buckling effect. It can be very effective, but the shawl, it, you have to finish the shawl a little bit differently to take advantage of that buckling as a characteristic. And instead here, it looks like there's just tension errors and that may have contributed to the pick errors that occurred because it's possible that the threads that are in the basket weave sections between the undulation may have had a different tension on the, sh on the loom than the undulated threads. The twisted fringe is done very well. Uh, the bundles chosen, the bundle size chosen for the twisted really nice. fringe. I don't know if you can lift up a, a fringe there so yep. they can see it. Uh, they, they're very nice and they don't distort the edges of the shawl particularly, although as you can see an open place right here and a bit of drawing right at the undulations, because this area is more open in the weave, these bundles were twisted up too tight and caused this scalloping shape right here. And down here at the bottom of the basket weave sections, you'll see that the bottom weft thread is dropping because that should have been pulled up a little bit tighter when the twist was twist occurred. Um, yeah, and you can see that it disturbs that. Mm -hmm. So it takes a otherwise pretty mm -hmm. lovely presentation. And the drape, um, you know, it's Romney, so it's, it's a little bit stiffer, although they did a, a really pretty good job of uh, matching up their set to their yarn size. So it does have a reasonable amount of drapeability. Um, and they, it looked like the weaver was having a little bit of a challenge getting going because there's some overbeating at one end, which I'm guessing is the beginning. Let's see here, we can find that bit. It's that end. This end? Yeah, you'll yeah. see that it's it's a little tight and then there's a little bit of loose. It looked like the weaver was having a little challenge getting started and getting their beat under control. And if I show you here, right there, that's an end whose head has popped up. And this a little bit more wet finishing and closer trim would have taken mostly taken care of that, let's see. But overall, a really lovely shawl and certainly the pattern and the color palette are um, A plus. Yeah, the color and the color of the hand dyed warp with the white weft actually displays the pattern very nicely and you do get a sense of um, that undulating water. Yeah, yeah, which is, and it's, it's quite lovely. Um, so overall, it's a little stiff. Uh, it's the, the, the fell line beat issues uh, and the scalloping at the edge do bring the quality down a little bit. And it presents well though. It presents very well. All right, on to number three. On to number three. And I, I will uh, just ask people who have questions to hold them for the end, especially if you have a question about a specific shawl or anything like that, especially wait until, uh, Kay and Sand are, are done discussing that shawl because I, I think a lot of times they will answer those questions in the meantime. But we'll, we'll leave a question and answer uh, portion for the end. So thank you. So far, we're doing great. Uh, and as far as time goes, I think we're doing really well. So uh, let me get uh, team number three up and running here. All right, 
this one has a soft spot in my heart because, of course, it's rainbow. Um, <clears throat> team number three. This is um, a Rambouillet commercially spun warp and a Corydale waft with some Angelina carded in. And, of course, you know, sand is on Team Sparkle, so that, that <laughs> read well there. Um, it has a set of 10, and the picks per inch are, is also 10. It's an 88 inch long shawl with a 19 and a half inch width. Um, obviously the warp is done in <clears throat> a gray, no, it's, it's brown. Well, sort it's, of gray brown, brown. Um, rambouillet and the weft is what's been dyed. So it was dyed in the locks. Uh, and that's a great picture of the colors laying mm -hmm. out there. So they also chose to put some locks within the weaving, which is a really nice effect. Um, they did, however, have small issues with getting them anchored properly. So um, some of them would pull out rather more easily than, than you might hope. Um, let's see. Move into the spinning. So yeah, take a look at the spinning. So the singles are inconsistent. And with this draft, the inconsistent singles can really obscure your pattern or disturb it, especially because the detail in the center of the diamonds is quite small. And the intersection of the intersection of the diamonds, there's a couple of places where the weaving is the spinning made a very large single and it puffs out and takes your eye away from the rest of the pattern. The it's moderately underplied, and so that actually results in an even more uneven WPI. There's some places where the plying looks like a spiral ply because one of the singles was very small, one of the singles was very large, and whoever did the plying did not compensate for that. And the plier can compensate for a lot if they're looking at the twist angle of the singles coming in. It becomes very important to feed back to your spinners as they're spinning if bobbins come in and they're remarkably different from the bobbins that have been before or after, it's important for the plier to speak up about that and ask the spinner to change their technique a bit. The set is appropriate to the yarn. That's a particularly nice photo right there. Although you can see where some of those little diamond shapes are differently shaped because the underlying weft yarn is a different diameter. That's how it affects the pattern. Can be a choice. You wanna choose it consciously. In the terms of a competition like this, you want to choose for as even as possible because we're looking for mm -hmm. that draft to be structurally apparent. Mm -hmm. There are some treadling errors and you can kind of see one there coming into, coming off the pink and into the more red, you can see where. Um, and that's a thing where the weaver, the, the team must be able to choose a pattern that can be executed in a competition setting, but has enough complexity to have strong interest shows skill of the weaver to pay attention where they are. It's easy to get lost in competition and get your treadling off count, but you have to be willing to quickly pick it back. So a skill for the weaver is to be able to unpick fairly quickly and find their place again in their weaving. Mm -hmm. And there are places in the shawl where they clearly went for an inch or two before they realized that they had gotten off pattern. Okay. Um. Balance. It is a balanced weave. So as you look at it here, you can see that the diamonds are roughly the same size throughout. So they were able to uh, keep their beat even through the main part of the shawl. The, they, they did kind of a border effect, um, which didn't work out well. It looks like it belongs to it. a different shawl. You it's can... tight and compacted. The darkness is because the weft threads are packed in very tight. And also, um, it looks like the they use singles. So a single, of course, if you're working with a two ply, your single is roughly half the component of your two ply. And so switching down to a weft yarn that is half the size causes all kinds of um, craziness with your weaving. And the um, two ends are not beat to the same border length. One is almost twice as deep as the other end, unfortunately. And they did hem stitch with the singles yarn 
kudos to whoever did the hem, hem stitching, the hem stitching, because that's really hard. Singles come apart on you, especially since the twist angle is not very high on this yarn. And the downside here is that it's going to become more unstable. It, over time, it will be more likely to break. And while the hem stitching was well done, those singles are going to give up of, under abrasion and wear. And I would recommend strongly against actually mm -hmm. using singles for hem stitching. This, this compaction here, it really would have appeared better if the two ends had been the same length in that compacted mm -hmm. area. But any, if you're using singles to stabilize a fell line, it's gonna be more at risk even packed in like that. And one of the options is to use a different uh, treadling for those. It looks like they did actually uh, adjust the uh, M and W rather than the diamond shape, the closed mm -hmm. rose path but it just doesn't give a very good effect. It takes away from other aspects of the shawl. Now the, the hem stitching and the knots on the fringe are really well done. They're not um, knotted. The fringe is not knotted at the bottom of the hem stitching, which gives oh, it even right. more Sorry. instability. But it's, but it's also right up next to the fell line. So there's no gapping. They chose small enough bundles to actually create a nice fringe. Um, just looking for the salvages. Hmm. Salvages. Well, salvages were okay. I mean, it was pretty even. There's a little bit of, of a wobbling, but um, they weren't too bad. Um, and so as a result, the shawl is about the same width across. Um, and it's got a nice touch. It's a little stiff, but it's got a nice like a heavy wrap it around your shawl on a cold winter morning, cushy, blankety kind of feel. So, I mean, I would absolutely think of it as a, as a lovely blankety shawl. Mm -hmm. And it does have pretty good drapes. So that tells me that the, the set's well chosen. I did find that the treadling errors do distract from the flow of the pattern. And granted, when you're wearing it and you're moving around, probably nobody would see those, but you know, I would see it while I'm wearing it out of the corner of my eye and that mm -hmm. would affect the flow of it. So overall, um, really beautifully chosen colors and pattern um, and the lovely little locks that are hold it up again, that are locked into the weft are a really lovely touch. Yeah, they just need to be locked in a little bit better. And I suspect that this shawl was not really thoroughly wet finished and fold, which would have locked those locks in a bit more. And you wanna lock in a longer distance on the lock as well so that it stays put and you're relying on it to felt into place with hard fulling. A little more fulling would have reduced the width of this shawl and it just barely made the minimum width, but would have given you a more secure so this is where sampling ahead of time is really important because sampling ahead of time lets you figure out, okay, what is my final drawing after wet finishing? And I would have liked to have seen that to lock this down. The Coria Dale that was used for the weft should have locked down beautifully. Um, I'm, I'm, are the, I would be interested to know later if the locks are actually Cori locks or if they're, uh, some, they look like they are Cori locks. They probably from are. The, so the Cori should have locked in, and those locks should be quite secure because Cori has an excellent interlocking features to its scale. So it just wasn't finished hard enough to lock those down. But overall, well done. All right, on to number four. All okay. right, team number four. They did spin their warp. It is a Cori warp and the weft is also a Cori. Um, the set is at 10, <coughs> the PPI also at 10. The shawl is 72 inches in length and 20.5 inches in width. It is, as you can see, coral, peach, and turquoise um, with a cream weft. Uh, I will comment here that the color, especially in this photo that you're seeing right now, colors present very, very nicely. And you can see that the shawl has reasonably good 
drape as it's hung there so it would be quite comfortable, but there are some issues with the set that was chosen, which we'll get into in the weaving a little bit later. Okay, on to the spinning. So the singles are quite consistent on this shawl. The plying is balanced. When you look at the singles as they exist in the ply, there's no places really that show kind of a spiral ply, an extremely larger single plied with a extremely smaller single. The twist angle appears to have been completely balanced out. So again, what balance really means is that you've removed all the twist from the single in the plying so that the, the fibers are running parallel to the line of the yarn and the twist that you see is the two singles twisting together. So that was done very, very well. You can, you can really see it in this photo. Oh yeah, you can see, yeah. And, and there's you know a little bit of normal human variation, but overall you can see that those singles really sit nicely in there. And that's a characteristic of having good spinning and good plying. Mm -hmm. Now they did choose a set that was a little too open for the uh, size of their warp and weft. Um, so it does mean that the pattern um, details are a little less clear. Um, and the problem with the set here, and this is why it's important to do uh, wraps per inch. I'm just going to pull up this little tool. I don't know if you guys can still see us. No, it's just the video. We'll just, to, okay. We'll um, the, later. the problem here is that the set might have been appropriate for plain weave for these two yarns. But because there is a twill type pattern, the set is too open. You have to close your set up. And if the shawl had been the same number of ends and then at, at the probably closer to a set of 15 instead of 10, it would have been under the width necessary for the competition. So and you can see in this photo here how open that set looks. Um, and. and it's kind of difficult to kind of decipher what the pattern is trying to do. Because there is a pattern here, but it's very mm -hmm. hard to see it. It's, it's more visible on one side than the other, mm -hmm. but it's very hard to see it because the set is too open to display mm -hmm. it. And this is another case where harder or more vigorous fulling to finish the shawl, a true wet finish, would have closed some of that up and made the pattern more apparent. Again, the mm -hmm. shawl would have been under width if that mm -hmm. had occurred. So I do know that in a competition, um, you don't wet finish your shawl. Um, you and, can. And I, and I understand that often that is not done. Um, <clears throat> however, um, sort of on an educational perspective, we wanted to mention that in some cases, wet finishing would really help a particular shawl kind of see its true beauty. Um, these guys, this weaver was great. She managed, he or she managed to, I guess I should use they, they is better. They managed to actually keep an even beat throughout, even though this is fairly open. So one of the challenges with an open set is that you can crush, uh, you can beat too tight and crush the whole thing. And the there is a pick error. There's a few treadling errors and there's um, a warp tension error at the beginning um, of the shawl. But overall, it's very it's a very even shawl um, from the perspective of it stays the same width throughout. Um, and we did get a really nice, the, the weaver did get a, a really even beat throughout, which I, they yeah, was fantastic with, with just a couple of exceptions. So they chose for their finish hem stitching and twisted fringe, which is a lovely finish. Um, Selvages are a little bit uneven. They're a little, little more wobbly than they needed to be. So when this, uh, when they finished their shawl and they actually got their hem stitching really nice and tight up to the fell line and their twisted fringe up tight to the hem stitching, which creates a really beautiful finish. Um, and totally secure. And it's very, very nice. Mm -hmm. This shawl should last for years. Mm -hmm. The number of threads in the twisted bundles. Really nice, well chosen. Um, it has great drape. And that's one of the things about set is when you choose a more open set, um, it's kind of a balancing act. But if, it, if your set's a little more open, you can create a lot more drape. It is a hand spun warp and the, the warp is 
quite good. It was very well done. And again, I think the color play was really lovely. Mm -hmm. But the, the you can see in the fringe, this hand spun warp is very even. I mean, it looks, it, mm -hmm. this is a strange thing to say, it looks like a commercial yarn. Sometimes commercial yarns are less even than hand spun yarns because the machines don't stop and they make mistakes. Here, you can really see that it was mm -hmm. done beautifully and they really chose nicely in the size of those. I'm just really, really pleased with this because these twisted fringes, they drape, they hang, they become a nice accent to the shawl rather than detracting from it on the edges. So well done, very well done. It's a beautiful shawl. Oh, good. And the open set has an advantage. It does have better drape than it would have. Oh, you did. <laughs> sorry. Um, reading notes here. Okay. Yeah. On to team number five. Yeah, I will get that set up in, in just one second. I, I did want to mention the yep. rules typically uh, in the sheep to shawl competition typically do forbid uh, wet finishing. This year we actually removed that part because we didn't know how much extra time there would be and whether teams would be able to or not. So there are a couple people writing in saying, oh, that's not allowed. Well, typically it's not, but if you read the rules this year, there was not anything in there that said that wet finishing was so not been, allowed, so. Commenting on that, I've been in competitions where things were quickly wet finished versus yeah. competitions where they weren't. So it's, it, that's a variable thing on a competition. Uh, if you look at a sheer to shawl, which is usually a week long event, there's definitely wet finishing involved in the end of that. And I, in the, that's a difference this year in the virtual presentation of this. Mm -hmm. The virtual presentation allows for wet finishing. As a judge, I'd like to see what the final is after it's wet finished. Mm -hmm. And then it comes to the judge after it's had a chance to dry and relax because you're gonna see the real measurement and the real quality of the fabric as it would go to whoever it's going to. However, because generally, the Lambtown rules up until this year have not allowed for wet finishing. We did not count down if someone did not wet finish their shawl, just so that you know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Perfect. Let's get on to uh, number five. Number five. Number five. I'm in order. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> this one also um, hand spun warp. It is a wool with a silk stripe, weft also a wool with the silk stripe. The breed is not disclosed. It has a set of 18, a PPI of 16. The shawl length is 74 inches and the shawl width is 22 inches. This is a fantastic design. Um, the silk is in the color stripes and the wool is all cream. Um, kudos to whoever did the design work on this. This is really beautiful. Um, I also um, personally kudos to whoever did the spinning of the silk because it is not my favorite fiber to spin. So <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Um, you can see from the photo how beautiful that drape was. Yeah. All right. So yeah, it does have beautiful drape um, overall. Spinning. So the singles in the warp and, and the plying of those singles really, really balanced and, and beautifully done. They're nice and even. The singles in the weft show some irregularities in diameter, not enough to really take away from the overall effect. And part of the reason that, that it doesn't take away from the overall effect is that whoever did the plying balanced the singles. They were paying attention as they came in and have enough skill to create a balanced effect. You can actually see one of the errors we're gonna talk about later in that, <laughs> in that picture right there. So I'm really, really mm -hmm. pleased with whoever did the plying because they were paying attention and altered things, whether because they have an intuitive sense of altering what goes through their hands or they have technical counting skills, but they did a really nice job. And so as a result, even though some of the singles are uneven in the weft, they were balanced out, so they appear quite even in the overall plying. This is why we ply yarns, one of the reasons why we ply yarns. The silk yarns were well spun, and I'm referring in this case to the silk that was spun during the competition for the weft silk stripes. It's a little fine. The yarn is a little bit small 
for the set that was selected. So the yarn diameter versus the set chosen a little bit off. You can see right here in this photograph, one of the problems with this particular shawl, it had some um, troubling errors. <clears throat> um, there are some pick errors as well. And the beat is not consistent throughout. It was fairly even, but there were some spots where um, the beat kind of got a little too tight. Um, we'll go over that. The, the beat angle is 30% in 30 this degrees. case. 30, I mean, 30 degrees in this case. So um, what a balanced weave is looking for a 45 degree angle on the finished weaving and this this sits loose. Um, I guess loose is not really the right term, is it? Well, it's okay. at the wrong it's at the wrong angle for a, a balanced weave, and the a balancing the weave would have increased the drapeability rather than decreasing it in this case. Mm -hmm. One of the um, things that happened in putting the weft stripes in in the way that they were done. It's a bit tricky because they didn't take them through the entire shawl. They stopped um, short and did a join. And most of the time they actually did Let me a really- show a good one here. Here's a good one. They did a really lovely job. Let me see if I can get this sorted out. Okay, so they did a really lovely job of doing that join. Interlocking. You can see the interlock there on the purple. Um, unfortunately, yeah, one spot. This one didn't come out as well. And this is a case of the undyed wool is actually pulled too tight away and separating from the silk because the silk sits in line. The wool is more elastic and pulled back. So the weaver pulled a little bit too tight on that or missed the interlock completely. And so there's a hole there. Um, the complexity of how did we get everything? Yeah, the complexity of pattern is, is it's a simple advanced twill, but the stripes really bump it up quite a lot in terms of looking at the complexity of the design overall. Um, However, there are treadling errors where the weaver got lost. And even in a, it's so easy to do in a competition setting, but as a result, there's these broken places, particularly at one fell line, it looks where the shawl, maybe where the shawl got started, or if it's at the end, it's because the weaver got in a hurry. You know, we're human, this is what we do. So the finish on this guy is really lovely. It's hem stitched and knotted, and it's done beautifully right next to the fell line. And the bundles are chosen really well so that they don't pull the fell line um, out into any kind of distortion. So it just has this really gorgeous, flowy, lovely fringe. Um, so the tension is a little uneven on the selvages. You can show it right there. Where the silk stripes are, the weaver needed to take into account that the silk, because it has a very different body, was going to cause this to stand out like a small scalloped point. And those should have been pulled a bit tighter on that edge, only on the selvage edge. Mm -hmm. And so that makes the selvage a little bit wavy. Okay, and but overall, we did that. Yeah. Yep. It's a beautiful design that's very, um, very well thought out in terms of the design, how the colors were placed, um, using the silk as an accent. Um, it's got good drape um, and really well finished. So well done. I think that's it for that one. On to number six. Okay. Number six. This has a commercially spun warp that's been over dyed and the weft was done in a dark merino cross. The set is 14, the PPI is 10. The shawl is 75 inches in length and 19.5 inches in width. Um, the warp is red, 
kind of a chartreuse green and purple. And the weft is a beautiful espresso merino. The singles show some, well, look at this beautiful picture. It is actually quite a lovely piece. You can see though from this photo that it doesn't drape quite as well as some of the others. It's a, it's a little, little heavy, a little stiff, but it would be quite wearable. Again, it makes that kind of blanket shawl. Mm -hmm. The singles show some inconsistency in diameter. The plying again here though is fairly balanced. That, that does so much to make up for any inconsistencies in the singles. The set of it though is a little bit too tight for the size of the warp yarn. And they, the weaver managed to beat in to match. So it's, it's fairly balanced, but the whole thing has that stiffer feel because they the look at the warp versus weft, um, what was going in, the warps, a little too close together to give this a good drape, a good open mm -hmm. hand. That's a, a place where, again, I recommend testing, 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 because what you wanna do is weave a small sample. You wanna sample mm -hmm. and see how the drape is on that sample. Uh, one of the things we'd like to see as judges, it would be nice if teams actually provided a, a sample of what they planned. And then, you know, I, there's, there's a mixed bag there, but it's, it's interesting to see how that gets played out. Mm -hmm. And that's the things that you do as a team when you're practicing. Um, the, the fact that the set is a little too tight also has caused a little bit of um, lumpiness in the selvage. Um, but in general, the beat's good and the shawl is even in width from the, you know, all the way across. The um, unevenness in the singles mm -hmm. also caused part of the, the selvage issue because mm -hmm. sometimes there's a, a, a large single that right there. Yeah. Um, there. This shell has no treadling errors, no pick errors, um, and no tension errors. Um, in the warp. But there's some, beat, a little bit of beat. There's, there's, a few, there's a few places where the beat is not exactly even, but overall it's really well done. Um, it's a fairly simple draft, this one. Um, the, the, the thing that makes it work is that the warp was striped. So you're actually showcasing that striped warp with this um, plain weave. Um, it's a really good use of plain weave. Um, although for competition, it is a very simple structure. Um, It's finished with twisted fringe, um, which is very well done. And it sits up next to the fell line. Yeah. Although the bundles are a little bit too big, which causes a little bit of distortion. It just gap um, from the fell line. It, it gaps a little bit. Um, but overall it- You can actually so you can, see no, the other way. <laughs> yep. Let me see if I can get this to kind of- yeah, you can kind of see where it pulls apart and gaps a little bit because the bundles were a little bit large. Um, and some of that is that they, the, the warp yarn is actually quite a big yarn. Um, so it, it becomes a bit of a challenge to figure out exactly how big to make those bundles when you're working with a larger yarn. And you have to choose um, those, the size that you pull into the twist. You have to choose it taking into account the size of that yarn a bit more carefully. So these bundles are too big. And the problem is over time, that gap between the top of the twist and the bottom of the fell line, that gap will put the weft threads at risk because they will walk. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I will note about this shawl, and this is something that can absolutely be a choice. This Merino was not scoured completely um, lanolin free. So, you can actually feel the lanolin in it. Um, it's not necessarily a negative. It's just a thing to note. And um, this would be a great rain shawl because nothing would get through it. It would be fantastic. Um, it's got pretty good crushability um, in spite of the fact that it's got a little bit uh, of a stiff hand, but um, overall it's a, it's a really lovely piece. And right here, you can actually see one of the beat errors. You see that dark line that's occurring right there. That's where it was beat a little bit tight. But what I wanna say though, is especially know your skill set. And this was, again, the draft while simple was well chosen for good execution. 
-hmm. And sometimes what you want to do is choose for what is going to be a good execution rather than the most complex draft in the world, which can get lost in your colors. So this was an excellent choice. Well done. All right, on to number seven. Okay, I'll get us set up for number seven here. And before we get on to it, and I'm just gonna stem off any of the questions that are coming, gonna come in on the chat on this one. Uh, this one is a uh, crochet and it is an exhibition team. So before we get a lot of uh, comments in the chat saying, I didn't know we could do that or that's outside the rules. Uh, this is an exhibition shawl, uh, first time that uh, we tried to do that this year. So let me get this one up and here is uh, team seven. Well, team seven. Work, working on it. Here we there go. we go, <laughs> yay. Okay, so um, as Ryan said, this obviously is not a woven shawl. Um, so it is, uh, it, it was submitted as an exhibition piece. It is done in um, a, hand, uh, a natural colored hand spun with walnut dyed borders. Um, so at this point, I think they had, this shawl has pretty good drapeability. So we'll talk a little bit about the spinning and a little bit about the design just um, as kind of feedback for the makers, this team. Um, the shawl is 65 inches in length and 17 inches wide, just for reference. Um, the motif, you can kind of see it here in this shot where there's a, um, a motif, uh, two different motifs. There's three of one and two of the other so that you're seeing that uh, two motif there in the center. Um, the tension, there's a little bit of a tension issue here because those motifs, that, that those two motifs were worked at a tighter tension than the three motifs on that go in between them. And it's because this is a more circular design versus the very square designs that are at both ends in the middle and the circular nature of those um, effect, those motifs, cause the shawl to buckle out at that point. So there's no way to get an even selvage edge because those naturally buckle out. So there's a scalloping effect so that's kind of going a scalloping there. deal. Yeah. Okay. Um, the singles are very inconsistent here. The diameter and the twist, uh, the, the diameter and the twist of those singles is inconsistent throughout the shawl. And as the plying is under, it's underplied, which would have helped a little bit and potentially because it's crocheted may want to have been constructed the whole thing with the yarns in the opposite direction. So instead of our traditional spinning to the right, plying to the left, this one may want to have been spun to the left and plied to the right. And this is a known thing about crocheting undoing uh, that the ply. the ply because of the nature of the way crocheting moves. And that depends on the handedness of the crochet, are they working from the right or the left because that changes mm -hmm. which way it adds or removes twist. And this shot really shows the twist angle issues with the plying. And the inconsistency of the singles because you mm -hmm. see some quite large ones. And as a result of the size differences and just the overall diameter of the finished yarn versus the hook that was used, I would strongly recommend going up one to two, maybe even three hook sizes, the drape would have increased. You can see here how crushed together those double crochets are. They're like smushed right down on top of each other. And as a result, it's actually a little harder to see the pattern and it does in, uh, impact the drapeability. I think the yarns accommodating the inconsistencies in the diameter, a little more open crocheting would actually have helped with that. But overall, um, I think that it's, the design was chosen well for the yarn that was used, um, modulo the spinning issues. Um, it, I love the little bit of walnut dye on the edge and they did um, probably like a single crochet or crab stitch edge, not sure. 
Well, it's a combination. Um, of, it's a combination of uh, half doubles and, and okay. chains. So. I'm not a big crocheter. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, it's it's a really nice, subtle touch to the overall shawl. So um, when these guys get their, um, you know, as they continue to practice spinning and they get their diameter control and their twist angle down, and um, you know, they they're going to come a huge long way. Um, but it yeah, is very wearable. it's really wearable. It's really nice and, and it's very cushy. So, so it's a really nice piece. So, and kudos for them for jumping in, even if they did not have a piece that was um, uh, ready for the actual competition. Okay, so team number eight. Ah, lovely. No, that's seven. Oh, you got a. Wait a moment. So you can see from the photo here, uh, the shawl's a, a teeny bit stiff, um, but it looks, it's really going to be a very nice wear. It's got a good hand to it. This does have a hand spun warp, I believe. We're trying to find the note sheet, which apparently got put in the wrong place. Okay. Uh, it is hand spun yeah, warp. Hand spun. Yes, it's a yes. hand spun warp, mm -hmm. uh, dyed as well. And the warp is quite even and well balanced. The, the singles are even and the balance, the flying was quite balanced. Mm -hmm. The weft yarn is spun generally even and well balanced in the plying. Again, the plier did it, oh, you can see, it. see mm -hmm. the, the singles do not, they enhance the pattern rather than detracting from the pattern. And the plier did a really nice job of balancing everything. Uh, one spinner, it looks like one particular spinner probably has thicker singles, but the plier did a really good job of compensating for that, adjusting as it came in. So again, it does not detract from the pattern. Um, this is, just to kind of go back a, a quick second, this is a Romney warp and Romney weft. Um, the set is 12, the PPI is eight, it is 72 inches in length, 19 inches wide, both hand spun. Um, and then you can see here, just coming up on this photo, they beaded their warp. Not only did they bead their fringe, they beaded their warp. So that's a really lovely touch. Um, the, um, and it's, it's really beaded throughout. Um, I'm not seeing that it like one color was beaded and another not, it's actually all the way throughout. Um, the selvages are quite even. Um, the, it's the same width throughout. The only issue that happened with the selvages, and you can kind of see it right here at the bottom edge of that thing, there's a, a little loop thread. Some threads were missed as they came through the selvage area. And so one of the things that can cause that is if you elect not to use a floating selvage um, and you're having to um, over and under hand pick, um, hand pick your selvages, sometimes you can, um, lose a spot in this way. And so since this is a twill structure, your two <clears> options are you without a floating selvage, you have to either pick it and be aware that you've got to pay attention on every pick, how you're doing that, or mm -hmm. you put a plain weave at the edge in order to make the edge work as a selvage. Look at those beads. The beads are fun. Yeah. So interestingly, while a, um, a perfect, um, and I say that advisedly, um, a perfect balanced weave is at a 45 degree angle. Sometimes you might choose to use a different angle for a purpose. And in this case, they used a 30 degree angle. They have a very even beat and it resulted in a clear pattern and a very drapey shawl. Um, so it's that I think was a really good choice in this case. Um, the complexity of the design is good. The the draft is not super complicated, but they did some lovely striping. And of course we have beads. So um, that kind of ups the um, design game a little bit. Um, just, one treadling error. just spotted one treadling error right at the edge. Um, 
The color choices work really well together. Um, and this guy has a, a lovely finished edge. Um, they did a hem stitched and knotted. There's a little bit of gapping, but not much. Okay, it's not. Um, yeah, it's knotted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but they actually chose good size bundles. It produces a really nice fringe. Um, so I would say overall, this is um, a really beautifully done shawl. It's got great drape. It's got good color. And they, they actually um, put together their yarn design and, and weave structure very effectively. And if Kay pulls that together, you see that crushability right there. It'll just fold right around your shoulders. This is what you want. This is the one that will fold and crush around your shoulders and stay put while you move around and do things mm -hmm. without even necessarily pinning it. Yep. So, all right. Fantastic. Number eight. Now we're on to number nine. <laughs> all right, number nine. This is a wool tussa silk hand spun warp and a Romney lamb fleece weft. The set is 13, the PPI also 13. It is 18, or sorry, 82 inches in length, 19.5 inches in width. Both warp and weft are hand spun. Um, the warp is green, gold, purple, and gray um, in kind of a multi uh, as it comes across the shawl. Um, overall, it's a really good choice of design. And it has really good drape. You can see the drape here. Um, it's a very subtle color palette. Um, From this photo, all you can see, because it's a subtle color palette, you can't, they, the previous photo, you really can't see the design from any distance. You just have this sense of color and movement. Here you can begin to see that there's a little bit of um, iridescence that occurs because of the dark tones together. It's really mm -hmm. lovely. And this is a good shot of the fringe showing the... It's got a latticed fringe. So they actually hem stitched and then they tied a three level lattice um, which is really well done. Um, everything's really nice and tight up to the fell line and the fringe is long enough to actually accommodate a lattice. This um, particular picture right here, as you see that fold, you can see the iridescence mm -hmm. that occurs between the underlying warp color and the weft color. And there's the beautiful fell line. It's really nice and tight up to the shawl, beautifully hem stitched. There's no risk of the weft being damaged at the uh, edge. This one was really well spun both in the warp and the weft. The singles are even. The plying is even and balanced. Um, the set is well chosen for the yarns, the diameters of both yarns. And as a note for the whoever pulled the warp, they did a nice job of choosing position for the warp threads because they're we're, we're human, right? They're a little bit different from one person to the next. And you can see that because the difference is within a color family of the subtle striping. The Whoever pulled the warp did a very nice job of placing that so it worked well within the shawl without disrupting the balance of the weave. Now you can really see the pattern. It's got a really lovely draft. The selvages are extremely even. Mm -hmm. It has a really even beat. Um, the shawl is the same width from all the way across um, as you would expect with a beautiful selvage and even beat. Um, there are, it, it, this is a perfect 45. This is 45 degrees. This is a perfectly balanced weave. Um, there are no treadling errors, no pick errors and no tension errors found. So this is a beautiful shawl. Um, they did a fantastic job with it. It's very wearable. Um, the color and the complexity match well. 
Um, the complexity and, of the draft is well chosen for a competition setting. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough to be, uh, well, interesting when you look at it, but not unexecutable by the weaver when there's a lot of distractions, even yeah. in this virtual setting, there's a lot of distractions for the weaver. And you can see that look these that beautiful, fringe. and look at the fringe and the diamond, the, the diamond pattern is so beautiful there. It's really well done. Um, so overall, extremely well done. Um, yeah. Very wearable, totally a shawl nice, that I would nice. love to wear and should, Cushy, should hold up for years. And you can actually see as Kay holds that up, look at the selvages there. They're quite even, um, no misses. Okay. And that is number nine. And on to our final shawl, number 10. Then we have to dig through and get the top five out. Yeah. Okay, number 10. Number 10 is a Shetland warp, which was hand spun. A Romney weft. Um, the set is 16. The PPI is 8 to 9. The shawl is 66 inches in length and 20.5 inches in width. Um, the warp is green and the weft is gray. The color palette, I think, was well chosen. Um, it works. I think these two colors work really well together in, in this twill pattern. Even in this far um, away shot, you can actually kind of see the pattern, which is cool. Uh, but you can see from the way it's hanging on the mannequin that it's a bit stiff. Again, it's kind of a, a blanket shawl. So it is going to not crush around your neck quite as much, although it looks quite wearable there. So mm -hmm. that's a good thing to consider in terms of testing your, your fibers. The singles are uneven in diameter and twist angle. And you can kind of see a little bit of the texturing showing up even in this picture. Uh, some of the close-ups will show you that a bit more. Uh, having chosen the draft that was chosen, the singles unevenness doesn't detract so much from the pattern because it's a, a simple pattern in that respect. It's a extended point mm -hmm. twill. But it, the weft yarn is also too big for the chosen set. And as a result, the twist angle is, or the, sorry, the, the weaver's angle is like less than 30 degrees. And I think the pattern would have shown up a bit better if that had been accommodated. Again, this is a sampling issue. You need to sample what your singles are gonna be ahead of time and match them up with your warp yarn a bit more. The warp listed as hand spun is actually quite even. The warp, the spinning on the warp is quite nice. Um, there were multiple treadling errors and pick errors um, and one spot where a knot is used to join the weft thread. Um, generally not what you want to see. Um, I don't know if you can find it. Um, I'm going to look for that. So again, ends burying is, is a challenge for many weavers, um, but a knot is not the, not the appropriate answer. Um, Cause it's one of the things that happens with knotting just so that, that um, I can kind of be clear about this. A knot creates a bump. Um, a, a raised spot in a fabric. You can see kind. one of the treadling errors right there. Yeah. Um, and so when when something is worn, any kind of uh, friction occurs, that high spot will take the friction first and will break first. So a knot becomes um, a weak point in a structure. And the knot itself um, will probably untie itself over time. It's okay. just... The nature of knots. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that stands out most though as a problem uh, here, and I, I've actually got it, oh, let's see if I can get in front of the camera. Yeah, go that way. Okay, so if you see this line right here, that's actually a warp tension issue. This thread was at a different tension than the threads around it. And as a result, it either floated up when it should have been down or dropped when it should have been up and uh, the shuttle didn't catch it as a result. And that, you can tell that it's a warp tension error because that recurs throughout the whole shawl it looks... on that thread. And that mm -hmm. is a high vulnerability uh, location. Because you can, it, 
obviously I can stick my finger through it so it can catch on anything. Um, and so then, then you get this weird pull in your warp. Um, the other thing that I wanted to um, mention here, the finishing on this one, um, they did attempt a lattice, um, but they didn't leave themselves enough fringe to do a lattice. So the result is that it kind of looks like a mohawk. Um, it doesn't drape or lay flat properly. It just kind of sticks up. Um, that's the trick with lattice fringing is you really need to have some length to make it work properly and make it drape. Um, the bundles are slightly big. It's not a huge issue, but there is a tiny bit of pulling at the, at the fell line. Um, they did get their knots right up tight to the fell line. So that part worked out really well. Um, the, the fabric is pretty cushy, but um, it is a little stiff because of, of the, warp, the weft yarn being a little bit big. Um, and that's, this side really shows a uh, tension error in the start, probably the starting beat. And it, I, it's, yeah, there's something, something going on there. And the, then the knots pulled up tight enough. They've secured the weft, but they also seriously distorted the weaving right at that edge. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a distraction. Mm -hmm. yeah. But overall, um, a well-chosen draft and lovely colors for our final shawl. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so at this point, uh, we've seen all 10 of the shawls. And uh, let me just kind of reset where we are, just in case anybody has joined us lately. This is the Lambtown Festival 2020 Virtual Sheep to Shawl Competition. Uh, what you have seen is all 10 of the shawls that were entered and uh, created during our competition. What we're going to do at this point is our judges are going to name their top five. This is not going to be in any particular order, just like we saw uh, earlier how they went by registration date. Uh, Kay and Sand are going to give us their top, top five just in that same number order. Uh, so they're going to do those and I'm going to give them a minute to get set there. And then what's going to happen is I'll put up a graphic with all five of those in the top five. And I'll give you a, a half a minute or so to look at that. And then I will launch a poll. So this is gonna be a little bit interactive and you get to vote and see which one uh, you think is going to be the winner. And then we'll kick it back to our judges and they'll start counting them down uh, from five all the way to the winner. So Kay and Sand, if you are ready. We're ready. Mm -hmm. And if you would like to tell us in no particular order who your top five are, and then I'll go ahead and put them on screen. In registration order, team number one, team number five, team number six, team number eight, and team number nine. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and put those up on screen now so that you all can see them. There we go. And there they are. So there's team one, five, six, eight, and nine. So get a good look at those. And I'll give you just a little bit longer to look at them and then we'll launch this poll. And I see a lot of, of uh, messages coming in on the chats there as, as people are talking about what they like about those, that's good. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll here. And you all now should be able to ring in with what you think is gonna win. Wow, and, and it's coming in fast, all right. Over half of you have voted already, thank you. It popped up for us to vote too, but that doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, I forgot to uncheck the uh, do not let panelists vote button. Yeah, All no, right, no. so it, it's slowing down here. That's about 75% of you have voted. I'll give you just a few more seconds. Get those final clicks in. All right, let's end the polling and share the results with you all. 
So here we go. Team nine came in at uh, 40%. Team eight came in at 25%. Uh, and then team one and team five were pretty close. And uh, team six didn't get much love. So, uh, all right. Uh, Gina, if you're watching, I know you are. If you could screenshot that for me just so that I have a record of it. I know I'll get it later as well. If you could screenshot so that I have a... Uh, a good idea of what's going on. I will stop sharing the results here. And I will also stop the, actually, let's not stop the screen share. Let's leave them up. Um, yeah. And uh, let's see, how are we going to do this, Kansan? And we need to deliver your top five in the order. So let me actually stop this. There we go. Okay. So let me take a look at what slides I have available next for us. So the next slide that I have available for us is uh, the first, second, and third place with just their team names on it. So if you would like to give us... Uh, I'm happy to hold them up and count them down from five to one. I was going to say, let's do that. That's probably the best way. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me spotlight. Let me give you the spotlight back. And so let's count in, them down. In so let's, uh, fifth place, we have, and this is sort of a, it just worked out that way. In fifth place is team number five. <laughs> you never know how that's going to work oh, out. Yeah. So um, this one, uh, really beautiful design. Um, and it had some technical errors, which uh, dropped it a little bit. Um, and in number fourth place, fourth, in fourth place, Team number six, um, again, really, really uh, well executed design. Um, hold it up, sorry. A few minor technical errors. Um, and really the fourth place out of this combination of a very simple draft, well executed draft for the, for the colors, but because it's a simple draft that did bring it down a little bit in sort of the starting points and the commercial warp for was the other thing there well chosen but it does you know that hand spun warp does count for a little bit so with a hand spun warp in third position team number eight our lovely beaded warp um romney yeah. romney yes um and so a little bit of the sort of hand spun warp definitely bumped it up a little bit, um, but also good execution um, and a really well planned out um, set and and beat to get a really beautifully drapable shawl. All right, in number two, uh, okay. what? Oh, I was just gonna say one of the things that put this one in third place was in fact missed salvage edges. It does have a little so, bit so there, some loops, yeah. and that that's probably that's what put it in third place. In second position, team number one, this first one we saw way, way back, um, this um, really well designed uh, balance between the warp and the weft. Um, great singles, really, great yeah, line. beautiful um, spinning on this guy um, and a really nice drape and, and good overall presentation and in first position is Shaw team number nine. This one was um, extremely well executed. Um, the hand spun and, warp, well executed, well uh, thought out in terms of mm -hmm. its color play, the spinning, hold it up one more time, mm -hmm. the spinning and plying really superior choice of pattern, for the color and the size of the weft versus the warp. Just very well thought out, very well executed, very secure. There's no loops at the selvages, so it's gonna wear well over time. Yep. And, okay. and it really is a fantastic shawl. I would, I would totally wear it. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So give me one second here. I am going yep. to uh, share the photo of those three and We'll get the top three so you can see them all with their, this will be their team registrations. Okay, there we go. And uh, I'm gonna make you hang on for just one second before I actually reveal the team names. A um, Couple of things I wanna just say is thank, every, thank you all for participating, all the teams. I mean, this was a wonderful uh, competition. We had 10 teams, which is the most we've ever had. 
Uh, it was really exciting, really fun. Uh, there have been so many comments in the chat today about how much fun people had. Uh, really appreciative of this style of judging and being able to see the details in the shawl and uh, you know actually hear the judges for the first time. You know, uh, we always have the the microphone out there with Stephanie, but even with that, all the the regular festival noises sometimes it can be hard to hear. So uh, thank everybody for. Uh, playing along. Uh, this was really fun for us as well to put this on this year. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun to see all the interaction and see everyone's excitement. Uh, and then I, I do want to say, if you're enjoying this, uh, the, the uh, festival was free this year, but we do have a recommended uh, admission. So you can pay that through uh, Lambtown Festival app. You can also pay that through lambtown.org, and uh, we would appreciate that. So without further ado, I am going to uh, swipe this and reveal the winners. So congratulations to Lamb Chops Spin Along. Uh, that is a team that joined us from Washington State this year. They were one of our two competitors from the Seattle area. Uh, so it's really exciting to see uh, somebody really take advantage of the virtual aspect of this fast festival and uh, win from you know, 800 miles away or something like that. So uh, congratulations to Lamb Chops Spin Along and uh, Meridian Jacobs Farm Club in second place. Congratulations as well. Uh, this was uh, really exciting for uh, me to see Robin as, as a friend, uh, also for her to get a chance to weave. She's a vendor, so um, she normally doesn't get a chance to participate. Uh, so it was really nice to see that as well. And uh, congratulations as well for the third place finish for Hangtown uh, Fiber Miners. They're one of our teams that always comes out for uh, the competition. So thank you all for participating as well. I'm going to swipe one more time here. And that gives you all a full panel of all the different teams and all the different competitors and uh, both their team name and uh, what we call their, their team number as well. So we do have um, about 10 more minutes here. Uh, I'll give you all a, a little bit longer to take a look at these. And then what I'd like to do is just a little bit of Q&A. Like I said, we have about 10 minutes. So if you have a question, if you could reference uh, the particular uh, shawl number or team name, I'll leave this up while we try and answer the Q&A. And, and you could uh, send, you could tell us the question and so yes. you're filtering on that side, that'd be great. Yes, yes, okay. Yep. Okay, so first question we have here, and this one goes back to the beginning. Where did you get the twist angle tool? <laughs> oh, uh, hip <laughs> strings. Those are made by hip strings. Hip strings, okay, yeah. all right. There are a variety of, of um, vendors who make them, but the ones that we have are from hip strings. We had them made for our business, Stonewater Arts. Um, I, so. I will comment that when way back when uh, Jill and I were first consulting about these uh, twist angle and WPI tools, she measures with a micrometer to make sure that it really is, that line really is 40 wraps per inch. And she does make them in a bulky gauge as well as a fine spinner's gauge that goes down to 80 wraps per inch. So okay. highly recommended. Appreciate it. See if I could. Uh, somebody wrote in here, wants to know, what is a treadling error? A treadling error is when you, um, so let's say that you're treadling along and your treadling pattern is one, two, three, four, three, four, three, two, one, and you go one, two, three, four, two, one. So it's where you tread, you, you press down the wrong treadle. And so your shot goes through with the threads lifted and lowered at, in the wrong spot for that particular pick. Okay, perfect. And uh, one question, this is more directed towards us. There's a couple of them here. Uh, it says, uh, where can we find the members of each team? Uh, we just revealed the team names. It, uh, it's entirely up to them if, you, if they want to release uh, who is on each, uh, who the individual members are, but we respect their privacy. Uh, I can tell you that we will put uh, these photos with all the different team names up on the lambtown.org website on the Sheep to Shawl page. And then someone here. 
another question directed at the festival here says, how many folks have we had watching? Uh, most of the morning between 100 and 150. So uh, probably a, a about maybe twice as many as we would normally fit in the grandstands. Uh, so this is, is really impressive to see uh, that many people. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone uh, looks like she tuned in a little late said, is there a crocheted shawl? And yes, there is. Uh, team number seven is uh, indeed a crocheted shawl. And I don't, if anybody has any other questions about anything in particular that you wanna ask the judges, uh, I am not looking into the chats. There have been about 150 messages come in in the last few minutes. So if you asked a question in the chat, I am not able to find it. Uh, but the Q&A there, if you could type it in, uh, that would be great. Otherwise, if there are no other questions. Um... Oh, whoever, uh, to Judy, thank you. She said, thank you for a great learning experience. You're most welcome. This is a, a big component of what we believe in. Okay. That was our goal right. was, was to provide some educational content. And I, I have to say that I too am really a fan of doing things this way because it I have always had trouble hearing um, what the judge was saying at a competition that was live. Um, so this has been really fantastic to be able to do this um, in a much, uh, a much easier to hear kind of environment. I will also comment that I really, really like the double blind aspect that came in with this one. I really like mm -hmm. that because it takes out any possibility of knowing history. You know, our fiber community is not super large, so it's really easy to have an mm -hmm. idea who plus, various things are. So I love this double blind. Plus, of course, we happen to be members of the Spindles and Flyers Spinning Guild. So not knowing which shawl was produced by our team was super helpful. Right. <laughs> Okay, so the, the questions, uh, now that I, I threatened to leave, the questions are coming in. So uh, a couple here that, that I'll answer on our end. Uh, somebody said, can you explain the format for an exhibition shawl? And then along with that, somebody said, well, what about that, uh, the fluorescent team, the one that had the, the kind of locks in it? So the exhibition shawl, which was the crochet shawl, uh, team number seven, and uh, team number three was also an exhibition shawl meaning that they weren't actually allowed to compete. Uh, the crochet was not actually allowed in the rules this year. And then team number three, uh, there were a couple of board members on the team, but uh, they wanted to participate uh, to get the format of it and to get the feel and to actually go through the competition since it wasn't on uh, festival weekend. So that's what we mean when we say uh, an exhibition team. And then that's also what happened to the, the very bright show. Yeah, uh, so. I uh, question. Out for the knitters and crocheters out there, there are places where um, they have begun to run sheep to shawls that are designed for a knitted or crocheted piece. So there yeah. have been a few of those across the last few years. So and, and this virtual format, you know, really lends itself to letting us play with the rules a little bit. So, you know, make sure you're on our, our Lambtown Festival email newsletter and, you know, keep an eye out because uh, there's a lot we can do with this. This is a lot of fun. So uh, there's a lot of things that we can tweak as far as the rules go. Okay, we have a question here. What was the fiber on the winning shawl? The warp is a wool tussa silk blend, 8020, and the weft was a Romney lamb fleece. Okay, can, uh, ooh, she says name the weaving patterns. I don't know that we, we probably have time to go through all five, no. but how about you give us the, <laughs> how about on the, on the winning one? Do you happen to know? Uh, the, it's I don't, it's a twill structure. Um, I, weaving structures don't really have, don't, don't often have names per se. Some of them do, but um, so the winning shawl and the third place shawl are both. Um, well, they're all point twills. Twill structures. Is that a twill structure as well? It is, yes. Yeah, so they're all three um, variations on a point twill structure. Okay. Uh, question came in here. How many hours did you spend judging virtually and how long uh, would you normally spend on one during a competition? We were really cognizant of that because, um, you know, we could have like picked for hours, but I actually set a timer. We spent no more than 15 minutes on each show because we wanted to have at least some similarity to how much time a shawl would have been um, had you know, it would have taken to judge a shawl in a live environment. So we didn't want to take two hours picking it apart. We wanted to kind of 
keep things um, similar and kind of keep moving along. Perfect. And I do want to address, somebody brought up uh, fluorescing. The term in weaving is usually iridescence and the winning shawl, and I want to hold it up again, if I move it, it looks like it's sort of got a, a moving, shining aspect to it, even though, yes, there's some silk in the warp, but it's not the silk that's doing this. It's the interplay of the two sets of colors. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a very desirable feature, this iridescent. And you can get it in plain weave, but this type of point twill structure, this diamond, I have to trace backwards, sorry, folks. Um, this diamond shape here accentuates that iridescence. Mm -hmm. If you look up, um, uh, there's a whole category of, of weaving that uses iridescence mm -hmm. as a piece of the pattern. This is a bird's eye twill, that's what it is? Uh, no, it's too big for bird's eye twill. This is actually bird's eye twill. Okay. Um, at any rate, the silk does okay. help with that iridescence because silk is a filament fiber and so it refracts light in a different way. Perfect. Okay. And as long as we're, we're talking about that uh, first place shawl, uh, the question came in here, the warp on the winter, was it hand dyed? Uh, she says it was beautiful. Any info would be appreciated. We don't know if it was hand dyed. It was hand spun. So no, uh, it's from hand dyed braids. You so, can tell that by the way it lays out. We know that they're um, hand dyed braids. We just don't know if the team hand dyed them or if they. Um, we weren't given that information. If they actually Correct. had. Yeah, if they actually bought hand dyed braids from some fantastic dyer. If the team would like to provide that information to the festival, I'm sure that that vendor would appreciate the uh, business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Okay, uh, we've got time for uh, maybe just two more questions that are in here. And this one isn't about any particular shawl, um, but I, I will recommend, uh, I'll let you answer this, but I will say, I think the advice that you gave or, or what you talked about uh, for team number six is very applicable to this one. And the question is, do you have any suggestions for a new weaver of fiber pattern choice, et cetera, that is interesting, but not overly challenging? And wow. team number six was, was weft to our own devices. And I think they did just a, a plain, you know, fairly plain and simple, but as you said, you know, very, you know, it worked well for what they had. Yes. So I would say that um, since most sheep to shawl competitions um, restrict you to four shafts. Um, and this one for, for certain does. Um, choosing twill structures is oftentimes a really good choice. One of the things that you wanna look at is what is your treadling pattern? So if you look for something that has um, a nice pattern that's created by treadling um, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's much easier to keep track of when you're in a competition environment than something that is like one, three, four, two, you know, one, four, three, two, et cetera. You know, because what you want is something that you can actually just um, kind of get your brain on repeat and continue to do. So anything that does up, 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 one through four repeated or one through four to one repeat those types of treadling patterns are really advantageous. Um, you can also look, as shawl number six did, what, what are you doing with color and how can you use a, uh, how can you maximize the color and use a simpler structure to really showcase that? And, and shawl, uh, team number six did a really good job with that. I will say that I would recommend a team avoid uh, uneven twills. And that is the difference between a two-two twill, where every thread goes over under two threads, two other threads. If you go to an uneven, you have like the one-three twills. And the problem with those in competition, you miss a pick, you've distorted your pattern really badly, and they are generally harder to keep, keep track of. And so staying to quote-unquote balanced twills will give you a better shot at a nice even beat. It's really easy with one-three twills if, when you're not in competition, it's very easy ha to have them come out unbalanced. Excellent advice, excellent advice. Okay, we have one uh, last question and, and that one is directed uh, more at the festival so than you two, so I'll answer it. And the question is, do you know what the winners plan to do with the shawls and how could a person uh, bid on one? And I, I know there were a few times in there where the two of you said, wow, I, I would buy this, I would wear this. Uh, so good, good recommendations in there. And I, I will say to the teams out there, uh, 
if you know for any reason you, you do want to sell your shawl, uh, you want to put it up for auction or something like that, get in touch with us here at Lambtown Festival. Uh, we'll help spread the word, and you know whether you want to sell it for charity or just to uh, you know get your re recoup your investment for uh, the the fleece that you uh, purchased or whatever it is. Uh, we're happy to help you out with that. So, with that, um, I think that's a good place to wrap up our 2020 Lambtown Festival Sheep to Shawl competition. I cannot say thank you enough to Kay and Sand. Um, I. I don't think that uh, people m might realize uh, how much back and forth there was over us over the last week while we, we put this together and, and kind of said, okay, who's going to do this and how's it going to go? And, you know, how do we even, you know, hook up and, and uh, socially distance hand off these things? Cause you know, they already got shipped to us once and everybody knows how shipping is going right now. We didn't want to take the risk of shipping them again. Uh, so I, you know, I just want to very heartfelt thank you. Uh, I think you, you two both did an excellent job. I, I think you picked uh, a great winner. I, I know it was tough there. That, that top three was pretty tough, uh, but I just want to say thank you. And then uh, also give you uh, a shout out. Stonewater Arts is your business and Stonewater Arts, uh, is that right? Stonewaterarts.com? Stonewaterarts, yeah. There we go, uh, is where people can find you. Uh, you're both excellent weavers and spinners in your own right, uh, which is what qualifies you to uh, you know, be such, such wonderful judges for us. So I know that uh, you do have your own artwork for sale as well. And so with that, let's wrap it up. Uh, Lambtown Festival, lambtown.org. You can find us at the Lambtown Festival app. Uh, if you enjoyed what you saw today, uh, we really appreciate it. If you uh, went to the app or uh, the website, paid a little bit of admission, help offset our costs this year. And thank you everybody for tuning in and hanging out.